What's up, boys and girls? Welcome back to a new episode of How Do I Beat This? I believe we're already at episode three. Today we got a replay from a uh, very, uh, I think it's a bronze player, maybe a gold player. I didn't quite recognize the border, but it looked a bit orangey. So one of the two. Um, and he asked how to deal with Colossus. It was Crazy Bot who sent me the replay. He also said you can skip the first nine minutes. So that's definitely what I'm not going to do, because as we've learned over the past few weeks, or as we should have learned over the past few weeks, is that most of the time people have absolutely no clue whatsoever what they're doing wrong. And they guess it is be most of the time the reason they have for themselves why they lost is the wrong one. So we're going to be uh, looking exactly as to why Crazy Bolt lost. Now, first of all, his build order, of course, isn't very tight. Uh, but at a lower level, you kind of get to expect that. He still went hatch first, got a pool and a gas. I mean, all of it looks uh, <clears throat> kind of decent. Ideally, of course, the moment the pool finishes, you start two queens. Nice. Same thing happens here. Um, probably should start a pair of links to chase away any kind of probe and to be able to secure your third in an easier way. Now, there's no scout yet. He scouted a nexus, but hasn't really scouted anything else. What I'd suggest is either to just always go in to try and scout the tech with the overlord or to always just run in with run by with two links and try to go into the main base so if there's no unit in the wall you can go in if there is a unit in the wall your overlord will be able to see the tech so you have two options to see the tech in that way now this road yarn is way too fast this layer is very fast it looks like a two base build which isn't very common also it's quite bad um <clears throat> In, in, a, in a macro game, honestly, like the Evo Chamber is like a ZVZ build order, which isn't extremely useful. I believe, in my opinion, it's the best to play rather standard build orders, or at least try to play rather standard build orders, um, even if you're lower level. And uh, it doesn't really matter if you're lower level, whether your build order is tight. Like it's okay if you float 600 minerals um, but I think a cool thing with playing uh, actual build orders that are played at the pro level is one, it's very easy to compare what you have to what you're supposed to have. Like if you take any Lambo or any Cero or any laser replay, you can see, hey, what do I have? What do they have? And where did it go wrong for me? And then it's very easy for yourself to identify errors. But if you just play something random or uh, some people just suggest to, to build a lot of stuff, um, off of two bases and then take a third base and I'm I'm not a massive fan of that I think there is some value in actually learning build orders and there's a lot of build orders on my channel of course but there's also a lot of build orders on other places on the spawning tool or you can just get one yourself by opening a replay there's lots of replay packs out there just with a simple google away of any tournament almost always releases replay packs so th this whole early game is um is already quite bad so our zerg is really far behind from the early game um, there's very little information which is being gathered in numerous ways so we see our zerg has no info whatsoever on the tech on the third base and if any attack is coming now i understand that it's not easy to get all of these kinds of information but always try to have a link close to your to the path of where your opponent will move out so if you're the zerg you just leave one zergling here um, and then the moment he moves out you get a nice little warning or you could leave a zergling even here just to get a warning but at this point our zerg is completely blind and it's very scary to play blind i i have to say i tried a challenge like that in beating grandmaster with stupid stuff and it's really difficult to respond to stuff if you don't know what's coming so a lot of people think professional players have very good reflexes or very good reaction time that's true but it's also just we see stuff earlier because we have vision everywhere or we can anticipate on stuff because we're lacking vision in this area and his army is nowhere else so there has to be a drop or something like that um <clears throat> let's uh skip over this part i think i've uh, talked enough about the early game and how i believe you should be practicing to get better in that part of course always get a spore at your third base if there's still oracles around there's any kind of uh, air units around now the issue our player was uh, dealing with was colossus 
and he said, well, I built hydras, I built roaches, after that I built hydras and roaches and hydras and corruptors and everything, but no matter what I did, I just couldn't beat the Colossus. Now, that could just be a matter of not having enough stuff or not having enough upgrades, but it can also just be because your army composition is incorrect. So we see, I mean, at this point, um, the army sizes are actually in favor of the Protoss. So it's just slightly in favor of the Protoss, but if you're building Roach and Hydras, you should be up 20 supply or so. Otherwise, most fights will be kind of hard as a Zerg because this is very primitive tech. Uh, I think Zerg might be able to barely hold on, but it's gonna be... Well, actually, it's not gonna be quite close. So this is a good hold, actually. He has a lot of workers. So now Zerg is in a very good position. At this point, I'd suggest, if you have a hold like this, to either do an attack, or if you're too afraid of that, try to get something else going for you. So get some extra tech to go into Hive, or... Well, I mean, I like that you're getting gases, but... Usually you only really get the eight gases when you're going into a hive. So yeah, the infestation pit is a good thing here. Um, try to, after you kill a push, always try to get some map control. Put your army on the map. Make sure you get some more vision on the map. And I know you, it's impossible for a lot of people to get like a vision on, a vision on every path. But always on every map, try to have like three areas. Then think to yourself, hey... Where do I think is it important to have vision? And you can do this before. You can go into the every map separately against the AI and just look at these spots. Like, hey, there are three spots. And you could think, well, this probably is a prime location where he could move out. Then you have kind of this area and I guess this area. And then you don't really have the side areas covered at that point. But usually if his army is going to move from his base to your base, it's going to be one of these three areas. So try to... Try to pinpoint areas like this on every map. Most of the time, two, three areas maximum, and you can cover like 75, 80% of the map. Now, of course, if you see the, the the top Zerg players, they'll have a link over here, they have one here, like they'll have like 10 links spread around the map. You have full vision of the map basically in a line. I don't expect that, but try to pinpoint three good points on every map and be like, hey, I want vision there. And that's not only for Zerg, that's for every race. Now, if we move on, going into Hive. And we see Colossus, Void Ray, and I guess some some Templar. Or no, well, no Templar yet, just Storm for now. So here comes the Mass Hydra army into Colossus Salad. Now, this army absolutely gets hard countered by pure Colossus. So Colossus in general is kind of a bad unit, except if it's fighting pure Hydra or pure Hydra Ling. But anything that isn't pure Hydra or pure Hydra Ling is going to get absolutely destroyed. Which of course has to do with um, Coloss or Colossus being the, the hard counter to Hydra Lisk basically. And if there's enough in front and if you don't spread out well enough, it's going to be really hard. So what I'd suggest is either playing something like um, Hydra, Hydra Ling Bane, which is a very com common composition. Ravager Ling Bane or Roach Ling Bane. Um, you can play, if you really want to, you could even play Roach Hydra Viper, and then you pull the Colossus into your army. But you need something to tank for the Hydras, and that could be Banelings, or that could be Roaches. But if it's just Roaches, you probably also need a way to get to the Colossus. So then you can play either Roach Hydra Corruptor, or Roach Hydra Viper. But just pure Hydras generally is a very bad call to make. So... Now he remaxes on pure Roach Hydra, and it's already better because Roaches are armored, of course, Hydras are light, so they take more damage from Colossi, but it's still not going to be quite good enough because it's going to be really difficult to get to the Colossi if there's a big enough army in front. So you want something to get to the Colossi, and that's the either the Viper or a very high Corruptor count. So I, I do have to admit that if you play Roach Hydra, corruptor you need to play a very high tempo style because it's an army that is on the timer the moment your opponent maxes out um, and you're on roach hydra corruptor you're just going to have a bad time because this is an army that needs to trade over and over and over so earlier when he had a way better economy and his opponent was at 140 supply this army probably would have won him the game but at this point we see his opponent as like an absolutely humongous army a storm as well like lots of zealots like, there's no way that you're ever gonna get a decent fight 
with pure Roach Hydra against, well, this is 3 2 1 Colossi. Like, it's just practically impossible. And then remaxing on Roach Corruptor again is yeah is still a mistake. So I'd suggest either you play Roach Hydra Corruptor, but very high tempo, so constantly trading, keeping your opponent below 140 supply. You can also play Hydra Ling Bane. This way you don't actually care too much what their supply becomes. Eventually you can add Corruptors to that. Or you can just add Vipers to your Roach Hydra. And just Roach Hydra Viper, you abduct the Colossi into your army. Uh, it can feel like a very frustrating unit, but if you if you play with Banelings or with Vipers, you'll notice that Colossi actually aren't all that scary whatsoever. They die pretty quickly. Uh, the problem usually is getting to them. Yeah, you're not noticing the DTs, of course, it's annoying as well, but the game was already over. Alright, I hope that helped a little bit. Let's uh, over to the next game. Alright, boys. Let's uh, have a look at the second replay. This might be my second try, as I filled the first one. Um, in this game, we have Crimson Rain, who also had a question. Let's actually see what his question was. He built very early lurkers. They were out around seven minutes, but I didn't check exactly. Um, so yeah, probably struggles with lurkers. Let's see how he deals with it. Accidentally took a second guess. He says he plays one, one of my builds and I believe he's gonna play the Marjorie. Now, <clears throat> I have to admit, the Marjorie is one of the first build order guides I did. And this is actually one of the only ones that isn't as good anymore as all the other guides because it's an all-in that relied heavily on the charge damage from the zealots but charge damage got removed in the latest patch which means it's not as good anymore like the the damage output is just lower on top of that i see crimson rain is actually executing it rather poorly as well he completely forgets his second immortal or well his first immortal even and leaves his wall open which is also pretty poor so I, I can't remember exactly, but I believe you were supposed to hit with two Immortals and like 10 Zealots or 8 Zealots at around 520, I want to say, was the fastest you could hit. So Crimson Rain is really slow um, with the initial build order execution. And this is, this is why I always say you really gotta, you know, you gotta practice your build order, boys. Like if you're gonna do an all in, Try to do it as tightly as possible. Try to know the order of the buildings at least. Like it really helps so so much. Now in this case, Crimson Rain was doing a massive all in. He's gonna hit 30, 40 seconds late. And with about one third of the stuff that he should have, even with the initial push. So he should have two immortals and like 10 zealots. He's gonna get five zealots and a single immortal. He's playing against someone who's rushing lurkers. It's floating 13 on mineral. So this is like, first of all, it's very difficult to give any good advice on all ins, except like perhaps like micro better or your decision making and like where the fight was off. Um, but most of the time, if you do an all in and you don't win with it, uh, unless you're top GM, majority of the time you just executed the building correctly, which is definitely the case here with Crimson Rain, who is floating about 1400 minerals so the lurkers aren't actually the reason like you can't really play a macro game out of this like it's it's not a transitional build like it's you push once and you win or you lose which is the case with majority of the all-in so you can pretend that you play a macro game off of this but is is not really anything like getting a third base and a forge at this point i mean would at least spend some of the money but yeah I, I, can, I can tell you what to do against Lurkers. Against Lurkers, you want an Immortal Charge Lot army uh, with maybe some Storms, some Archons, and you Storm the Hydras and the Lynx, and you A-move slightly spread out with the rest of your units. But th that's not the reason why Crimson Rain lost this game. Like, his unit composition against this, in theory, is fine. It's just his macro wasn't good enough, and the initial build order execution was very off. Like, he, he wasn't... He went into a macro game with a build that is an all-in. Like, it's not possible. Like, it's just not, yeah, it's not a thing. I'm sorry. Especially because he did no damage whatsoever. If you kill a third base or something, it's possible. But yeah, this is, yeah, just not possible. So, I'm sorry Crimson Rain, but I can't give you much more than try to learn the build order a little bit better. And uh, maybe you'll get those wins. All right, we'll move into the next replay.
which will be the final one of today. Oh my god, boys, welcome to the final replay of the day, which is gonna be a Grandmaster level PvZ. And it's a 30 minute game. Oh, perhaps I should have checked the length of this game before I said I was gonna do it, but let's head into it. Um, he said, I made a lot of mistakes, but I'm still curious to see what exactly I could have done better. So we're just going to kind of pick him apart here. He's a 5.8k player is what I saw on the loading screen. And he's playing against Etranger, who is, I believe, a 5.9k player or a 6k player. So very evenly matched they should be. Now opens up with a Twilight Council. Doesn't even check for a third. Well, let's see how much you saw then, buddy. Well, actually, he's going to see all the attack. Okay, plays a Glaive Adept attack. Oh, this is going to be my Glaive all in. 5k Glaive. Okay. I can live with that. And Etranger does not really respond. Oh, it responds with a layer and everything. So, yeah, proper responses here. Now, this is not really a macro build too much. Like, this is an all in as well. So. Of course, the game goes on for 25 more minutes. But let's see what we can find in this all-in. When you use this all-in, your goal in general is to shade into the third, move towards the... Th uh, yeah, shade into the main, move towards the third. That's the, the main thing you want to be doing. But there's there's too many roaches. Out, like Etranger moves in, a, in the correct way. He basically did everything correctly. And then when you play an all-in, sometimes you're just going to lose. Which is what I said, you know, like if you get to this level of play, even if you perfectly execute a build order, you're just going to lose games. Now, this was a very good shade. Um, he still has the four DTs, which he can turn into an Archon. It's going to get some damage done, but yeah, I think Etranger is in a very good spot. If I was the Protoss player here, I would build a Forge and build a, a third base at the same time. You say, why don't you build a third base here? Well, there's an Overlord there. You want to get your third as fast as possible, so... Yeah, I, I, I just get that base ASAP. Turn these two into Archons. Get an Observer with my Adapts so I can clear some creep and start Immortal Production behind this. I'd never start Blink. I think Blink's a bad decision. You also should be careful with investing too much into Adapts at this point. I understand you feel the need to do something, but it's, it's dangerous to invest too much. This was definitely worth it though. Get a couple of workers. So you, you go into Blink, Forge, floating 1200 minerals, really should be getting into a third base at this point, like way faster. Like your third should be going up as you still have map control basically. And right now you're still, up until this point, you were controlling the pace of the game, right? Like he couldn't move out. At this point he can start moving out, but you have enough units to deal with that. So if your third was done now, there would have been basically no difference. Imagine you build a third like a minute and a half ago. If he moves out, your harass is going to kill every single worker. You just cancel your third base, defend at the natural, so nothing changes. Except you kill 35 drones for free, like with the Archon and with your four or five adepts that you still have alive. Now what happens is that um, he could technically move across the map, but he doesn't really need to. He can also just drone up, like he can do whatever the hell he wants because you don't have a third base yet. So he has so many decisions now that he can make. Like, there's so many things open for him. He can all in you, and it will be the same power as it would be before, except you have less money because you're not mining from your third yet. If he macros, you're going to be further behind because you don't have your third up. You're not producing probes from there. So there's a lot of things here that just got worse for you because you delayed your third base for no real reason. Now you have Blink, which I said before, I don't like. Ideally, you'd be rushing into a faster storm because you should have been scouting with your hallucinations to see what his unit composition is. And you would have seen a baling nest, um, you would have seen relatively low gas count, and then you just go immortals, two, three batteries, and you try to get into storm as quick as possible, or just add an archon or two. But stalkers, I, I would not suggest in this case, because if he gets a sufficient baling count, what's wrong with this guy? This guy is really mean. I wonder who this is. 
Imagine talking about not being able to multitask and then leaving a queen AFK for five minutes off creep. Good job, buddy. You played yourself. I hate clowns like this who just talk crap. Well, we see uh, a couple of banelings being morphed. This kind of push is completely useless, honestly. Like, it's super, super risky to be here on the map. And you might be thinking, well, why is it risky? You can just force field here and he can retreat, right? Yeah, yeah. When I'm talking about risky, I'm not too afraid of him losing this army. Like, this is an army that has some escape. The reason it's risky is because you leave this base completely exposed. What happens if 10, 20 links show up here? What happens if 3, 4 banelings roll in here? Absolutely no defense. You don't have air units. You don't have any map vision whatsoever. The only thing you can do is recall. And then you lose 5 workers and you recalled. So, good job. You played yourself full. Now, this is a nice play in theory that you push and do something at the same time. But warping in adepts is painful. Like, it's super expensive, gas-wise. This is, what, 8 adepts, 8 times 25 it's 200 gas. It's almost a new Archon, which is something you'd, you'd love to have, of course. This actually did a lot of damage. Holy crap. I didn't like the move still, but it still did a lot of damage, which is cool. Now, um, the next move, I, uh, I, I really don't like Disruptor against Roachling Bane. Against Roachling Bane, please get it out of your head to build a Robo Bay. Just get... Storm, Templar, um, one second. Where was I? Right. If with against Roach uh, Ling Bane Ravager, you ideally want Storm, you want Archons, you want your uh, your Zealots in a Prism, couple of Immortals to join. And this guy is pissing me off. I want to find out who this is. Um, fourth base. I'm not a massive fan of this fourth base, it's kind of isolated, easy, more easily open for run buys, and you have two very big areas to defend. So you have this area, so the moment Zerg gets in this position, he basically has control of your ramp and your fourth base. So you always need to be aware of whether he's coming from here or from here. And this rotation is relatively small, and Protoss needs to be here to defend this area and pros needs to be here to defend this area now that's a rotation that's almost impossible to make so that's why this fourth base is a little bit better it's easier to defend any kind of rotation because the rotations are going to be way longer it's going to be way easier to spot as well like i said storm charge archon immortal in general this is a this is the best combination in almost every matchup it's the best combination in pvp minus the storm is the best combination in or the unit composition in PvZ. And it does fine in PvT as well if you want to play that. I prefer Colossus, but you can play Storm, Archon, Immortal, Zealot. Absolutely fine. Up until a very, very high level. The highest level in the world. Like absolutely you can. As, uh, <clears throat> the problem with Stalkers is is that they don't actually do any damage and they also suck against Banelings. So they're not good. Basically, it just, it's a bad unit, that's what I'm trying to say. It's not, it does no damage. It's garbage. You know, like blinking around, like Bane, like before you kill the Bane Links, they'll explode on your Stalkers. Congratulations, you've lost another fight with Stalkers. Like, you can do anything. I can say, well, you shouldn't have gotten surrounded, but a good Zerg is always gonna be able to come from two sides, and they're gonna break your force fields with the Ravagers as well. So I think the unit composition completely wrong still. Third base is wrong. I like your consistent harassment. That's very good. Um, two Mira to deal with the prism, I guess. Yeah. I like that you're basically probing up this base. And a Stargate is good because you realize there's a hive and most likely there's going to be some kind of uh, brute lords on the way, perhaps. Now you even, I believe you spotted the Greater Spire as well. Yeah. It's nice. So all the simulators being taken. Speed this up a little bit. 
I mean, with the army you have and how your position is in the game, this looks really bad for you, honestly. You have zero map vision throughout the game, basically. Like you have some map vision here, but you need vision in many areas. You need vision here, you need vision here, here, and here. So it's four areas that you need to get vision in. Um, so try to do that. And this probably the area where you have vision right now is probably the least important as there's no real entrance to a base there just to a key position which is this position but yeah this th this point was way more important and you're actually losing some some infrastructure because of that now if a stranger realized how far ahead he was he probably would have just straight aim moved across the map with this like i don't understand uh, why he isn't doing that because he would have killed you like five times over before you would have been able to do anything back usually against uh, a brute lord corruptor i'd say go carriers or play tempest and i still say that i think pure void ray is kind of useless they're weak against parasitic bomb they kind of suck against fungal they're good to have in your army together with carriers but pure void ray mm, never a big fan of it once again you get surprised by an attack because you don't have vision there um, you're you're kind of getting outplayed a little bit and one also once again this base you you see how difficult it is to defend this base compared to a base like this, where you have such a natural position on this base. It's like, it feels good. Like you can defend this little, uh, kind of like a triangle if you look at it like this. And then you can easily expand into this fifth base as well, which is very helpful. And these void rays are in a terrible position. They're basically out in the open without any vision. Once again, of this area, of this area, what if his whole army shows up here and there's 10 corruptors? You just lose five, six void rays for free. Which is, of course, a massive waste. Um, you're getting some vision on this side, which is good. Your army is still to... Yeah, okay, well, exactly what I said. Except, instead of 10 corruptors, he only had 5 corruptors, so actually lose the divide. Okay, this is the problem with people like him. They encourage you to have bad moves like this, where your, your void rays were in a bad position, but you get a good trade. This was a bad move that should have been punished way harder than what's happening now. Like, you still get punished a bit, you lose some void rays, but this should have been like a game over kind of move. You know, it's not allowed to leave your void rays there. I'm not sure why he's countering void rays with 10 brute lords. No spores on the ground. Completely maxed. I, I know what Atranger would get if he would send the replay to is it in bar do I suck? 13 mutas, okay. Not sure. Yeah, like I said, mass void rate not that great, I'd go into carrier. So I'm just gonna fast forward this for a little bit because if you just keep making void rays, you're most likely just gonna lose because you have a crappy unit composition. Um your army movement is kind of okay, but always try to make two things happen at the same time. So um, you're pushing over here now. Try to have a run by here with 10 zealots, 8 zealots. You, you could say, well, you just 3 spines. Sure, but 3 spines die in like 2 seconds. You only have plus 2. Your upgrades kind of suck as well. So we have a couple of storms going down. Blah, blah, blah. blah. Try to perhaps get a different control group for one of your units. Makes it a little bit easier to micro, especially with Templar. Try to not clump all your Void Rays either. <coughs> this is this is going way too well. He's encouraging you to keep building Void Rays. He's doing all the Zergs that you're going to play in the future uh, a favor by pretending that Void Rays are good. But actually, carriers are a lot better. And you can mix in Void Rays with carriers, you can get a couple of Archons with them, but the the big power of your army should be the carrier, not the Void Ray. Because Void Rays really suck against Parasitic, Bomb and Fungal, well micro Corruptors. Okay, let's push forward, push forward, push forward. Now you're getting better vision now on this side of the map. I like the Templar at this base, this is good. You perhaps need some more cannons here, because this base is almost impossible to stop otherwise. Also, you're kind of lacking uh, run by or run buys whatsoever. Like you haven't really been doing any run buys lately, which is bad. Like you need to be doing damage to your opponent. You need to pull them apart, um, and it can be very easy. Like most of the time, you don't even really need to micro it. Like you just a move them into a base. 
while you're attacking another place. So yeah, like this. This is what you're supposed to do. Except you're only doing one thing at the same time. So this is really useless. He's like, well, thanks for the 10 zealots. I appreciate that. Thanks for the free phoenix. I also appreciate that. And now you're going to push out with this army and you're actually going to threaten. So the way that you usually are supposed to do it is either you do a run by to pull him out of position first and then you attack uh, a key location like this base for example or you threaten to attack and all of his attention gets focused here look Zerg is like oh ooh, I'm being attacked and being attacked then all of a sudden 10 zealots show up in this it's a very different story you know he he, he, he suddenly is like a bit panicked maybe his, his hydras are out of position like bam 10 zealots here like two zealots going here eight zealots here and then you don't even need to fully engage. You can just threaten on the edge. But that's where the attention goes. You see, his vision of the map is also very poor. He doesn't see a lot. And your fight here, you, you didn't need to fight at all. You were setting up bases, you were doing fine. Um, you didn't have any vision of his army, which oracles are great for that. Try to get a mothership as well with your army, so you deny his vision on your army. Once again, a run by that isn't doing damage because nothing else is happening. Really try to get this in your head that run bys are really only good either to pull an army back um, for you to try and stay alive or to put your opponent more all in, or it really is just as a as a distraction. Or if you wanted to do damage, you need to distract them somewhere else. Like majority of the players will be able to deal with one threat at a time. Especially at, well, this is, I guess, high Grandmaster, mid Grandmaster, 6k MMR. Like, they should be able to deal with that single DT. I like this. This I like as well. Like, this is two things happening at the same time. And most likely it's going to do a little bit of damage. Yeah. DT does, doesn't do a lot, but it does some damage. Now, imagine if you were clearing creep in the middle at the same time. Do you think he would have responded as well to this DT? I don't think so. Don't forget, it's always easier to be the aggressor than it is to be the defender. Because the defender needs to respond to things after they happen. The attacker can anticipate things because he knows what's going to happen. He sets them up after all. So you can queue up two, three things. Like you can queue up six zealots here. You can queue up four zealots from over here into this base. And then your main army moves over here. Now, if you have vision of his main army with your oracle on top of that, you just stand on the edge of creep. You send in your two run buys and then you wait to see what the army does. If the army stays over here, you just stay over here. If the army goes to the right side, you move in. If the army goes here, you move in as well. And then when he comes back, you just move away. There's no need to fight. You're doing damage in other locations already. Don't forget that. And all you need to do, like this, yeah, just aim move it. Now, you do manage to get out with the majority of your army. I assume you recall or something. Kind of missed that part. Actually, I'm not sure. You just flew in with pure void ray or what? Oh yeah, I guess you just went. To this is a bad move as well. Please never do this again. This is so risky. And it's just bad. Just go with your whole army. Like, there was so many void rays that you just wasted. Colossus are terrible. Don't build them in this phase of the game. Just storm, carrier, void ray, add a mothership. And you're gonna be fine. And just keep doing what you're doing with these run buys. But threaten with your main army. Put some pressure on our opponent. Come on. You can do it, man. Hell, even a prism at this point. You might think, well, there's nothing in the main base. But it's still nice to snipe tech, you know. Four zealots in the main. And it adds another dimension to your attack. Like, even if it's just three zealots or two zealots. Like, it's something he needs to deal with. People keep forgetting that attention is a big resource as well in StarCraft 2. If two zealots go and check for five minutes, like, they'll be able to take down a hive. Trust me on that. I've done the math. Also want to get an observer, yeah, like this, to clear some creep every now and then. And don't forget, always have two things happening at the same time. Here, once again, it's a single thing. Clear some creep. Okay, this was better already. Uh, <clears throat> some decent storms. Once again, I'd much prefer if you have vision of his army before anything happens. This way you can feed back the units or you can storm if you need to. But now you just clump everything up. You hope for the best. You hope the units that you want to fight are in front. And if they're not, well, then you just lose four carriers, a bunch of Templar for free. You lose your disruptors, which I don't think the disruptors are that great, but I mean, it's nice to have units in general. Mm. And I guess, I guess you just kind of lose now. Eh? Yeah, this is... Oh, 
mean they're okay, but they're they're not they're not great, you know. Especially against parasitic bomb. Yeah, so at this point you just lose. So yeah, try to work on all those things that I said and uh, I hope it was helpful. I hope this was useful for everyone. If you did enjoy it, feel free to leave a like, comment down below, and uh, don't forget to subscribe, trying to make 25k at the end of the year. And I'll do a cover of Santa Tell Me by Ariana Grande with background singers and someone else playing drums. If there's drums in that song. All right. Love you all. See you boys next time. Tomorrow in a new video.